That's the one we were talking about. Thank you for being good and good to us and good for us. And we just pray this morning that as we worship and study and remember that we will be overwhelmed and blessed by your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, welcome to Twickenham. Good morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. If you're a guest, we're really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. And I know that we come from a lot of different places emotionally, and so some of us are like, wow, it's been a great week, and others of us have been like, couldn't barely get here this morning. In fact, there may be some listening online this morning, you just couldn't bring yourself to get here. So knowing that God is good is a really great place for us to start, and that wherever we are, he is going to be there for us. Glad you're here, or I'm glad you're listening. 
So there's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate a little bit later on. If you have a prayer request, please indicate that, and we will be praying about those first thing tomorrow morning. Um, I want to introduce you to one of our newest members who's uh, kind of special, uh, at least he's going to be uh, pretty soon. Uh, I don't, Mike, I don't know if you got, I sent a, a picture and I don't know if I've sent, oh, we did, there he is. This is John Isaac Segrist. He is the son of Rick and Laura Segrist and the brother of Charlie and Livy, and he's more famous than you are. Okay, because on September 15th, he is going to be featured in a video in Times Square on the big screens for a celebration of Down's Syndrome people of all ages. His photograph was selected out of 2,500 photographs. And so now you can say, I know him, I go to church with that guy. Okay, we, want, we just want to say, Rick and Laura, uh, Rick and Laura congratulations on that, and we look forward. I think there's a buddy walk for Down's Syndrome in October, and if you want to participate in, in that, you can look it up online. But we're real proud of John Isaac, and I want to give him a hand right now. Let's just give a big hand for him. There's the Rick and Laura right over there. Hey, you guys want to come on up? So, here's the thing: no matter who you are in the kingdom of Christ, you are important and you matter. You matter, first of all, because you're made in the image of God, and you matter most of all because Jesus Christ, the King, loves you regardless of who you are. Let's stand, and we're going to worship together. We're glad you're here. Let's praise the good, good Lord. Come worship Christ the King. Amen. I will 
has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Lord our God is with you. He is mighty to save. The Lord will take great delight in you. He will quiet. Will be. 
Timothy chapter 1, if you'd like to locate that to follow along, uh, you can do so now. As I reflected on this, and uh, also on Jody's lessons he's presented to us the last several weeks about having positive, wholesome thoughts and keeping good thoughts in our mind, I really come to realize how difficult a challenge that is. The way our mind works, the things we see, the sounds we hear, even the s smells we come across will we'll invoke thoughts in our mind. And sometimes those thoughts will invoke more thoughts and, you know, you just end up down a rabbit trail at some point and you're like, how did I get here? Well, when we end up in those bad places, what do we do with that? And uh, in this passage, Timothy, or uh, Paul's message to Timothy, he has really presented him with uh, what we need to do there. Beginning in verse 12, 
I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me is the foremost Christ Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. So Paul's past, you know, it, it was well known by many. So he's just pointing out there in the glory that Jesus showed him and uh, presented him with a beautiful future in forgiving that. So won't you pray with me now? Father, at this time as we... Uh, set a time to partake of this bread, which to us is your body that was broken. We want to praise you for the good in our life and uh, praise you also for the bad in our life that you have forgiven. And thank you most of all. We, we bring these things to you through your son. All these things. Amen. So our human memories, you know, we have all these memories that we do have, but uh, we're assured as well in uh, Hebrews 8, chapter 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And really that is what Jesus' blood is about. It's continuously washing away the bad in our lives. Uh, let's pray again. Father, at this time, as we uh, partake of the cup, just uh, ask that each of us really reflect on your sacrifice and uh, that you are continually cleansing us, Father, and uh, making us a perfect being like your Son. All these things we bring to you through him. Amen.
Let's stand. Lord, let your grace raise from your hand fall on us. Lord, let your grace raise from your hand fall on us that we Hey, Stacy, um, you mentioned um, the things that we hear, and it, it, that really helped me because I, I just kind of stopped after you said that and started listening to what was going on during communion, and I just, I really felt present with all my brothers and sisters, so thank you for saying that. That was pretty cool. And, and during the cup, did you hear the baby, little baby talking? That was so neat because I thought, you know what, that's what Jesus does for us. He can make us innocent again like that. So it was pretty cool. Okay. So, sorry. I'm, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anytime. I'm just kind of processing. I get paid to process out loud. Okay. You have to go pay somebody. I, you pay me and I process out loud. It's a good arrangement. I like it. Let's keep this up. So. <laughs> have you ever thought about what people are going to say at your funeral? See, I think about that kind of stuff all the time. In part because I go to a lot of funerals. I, I don't go to funerals because it's in the job description, but it is in the job description, right? Pray over babies, baptize sinners, marry lovers, preach sermons, go to funerals and preach funerals and bury the dead. I do, I do that. And um, we've had 22 funerals here at Twickenham since 2015. But when I came on board, we've had, tw we've had 22 funerals. This, this year, just in the last uh, 11 or 12 months, Lisa lost her mom. I lost my dad. I went to a funeral this week. Didn't preach it. Wasn't involved in it in any way. Just it was the family member of, of one of our, some of our folks here. I went to that funeral and uh, three of the deceased brothers shared memories about him. And three of his children shared memories. Several co-workers, the preacher all talked about him. Every time... I go to a funeral, every time I write a funeral sermon, I, there's a little voice back here that whispers, one of these days, it's going to be you. And I wonder, what will, what will people say? I have a friend in Atlanta, she's getting along in years now, she is the ultimate southern belle. She's from Jackson, Mississippi. And she says that when she dies, she wants people to stand around and go, oh, Lord, whatever shall we do now? <laughs> I, think, I think there are three things I want people to say at my funeral. Okay, here are the three things, and somebody take notes, because I want, some of you may be there, all right? Three things. Number one, 
I want somebody, you've got to do this, all right? Somebody's got to stand over me and utter the quintessential Southern funeral home compliment. But you know what that is, right? We're standing over the deceased, we look at him and we say, don't he look good, right? <laughs> Just go ahead and make a banner, put a banner up. Don't he look good? All right, that's number one. Number two, I would love it if a lot of sentences in that, at the wake began with, hey, you remember that time? <laughs> and then somebody tells a story, okay? Because stories are like the smile on the face of a memory. And if people are standing around telling stories about you, it's, it's pretty awesome, okay? And then the third thing, I'm going to tell you that one in about 20 minutes, okay? And you hang on for just 20 minutes. Um, I've known a lot of people who plan their funerals in the minutest detail. I mean, they write down to not just the songs, but every detail. I've, I've actually had people write their funeral sermon and hand it to me. So that's how controlling some people are. Honestly, I don't care what you do at my funeral. I'm not going to be there, all right? I won't be there. You do whatever you want. Do whatever blesses those who are left because that's really who the funeral is for anyway. It's for the people. It's not for the one who has left. It's the ones, it's for the ones who have been left. My job between now and my funeral and your job between now and yours is to live in such a way that those who are left behind have something to celebrate. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine yourself celebrated? Let's look in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, it's uh, the last time we're going to be looking at our theme passage. Uh, the last is the last installment in the Imagine series. Uh, we're going to look at Philippians 4.8. By the way, next week we're starting a new series called Gmail. Um, seven letters from God. It's from Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So you should invite your apocalyptically inclined friends to join us, Okay. We're getting into Revelation. That's the happy hunting ground for religious kooks everywhere. So you probably know some. All right, here we go. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. We got it up here. Read it with me one more time. Here we go. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. The last two words in verse 8 are the key to living a celebrated life. Well, the last two main words, excellent and praiseworthy. In fact, this is one of those passages that's a great example of how this just incredible, practical, daily grind of living wisdom is found all through Scripture. Look, the overarching story of Scripture is we were separated from God by our sin, hopelessly separated, nothing we could ever do to regain the relationship. God could have gone and started over on another planet with new creatures, but he didn't. He decided to be faithful to us, whether we were faithful to him. And so he initiates this plan to reunite us, to give us a way to reconnect with him. And it starts with a man named Abraham, and out of Abraham, God raises up Israel, and out of Israel comes Jesus. And Jesus is everything the first man, Adam, was not. He is everything Abraham was not. He is everything David and Solomon and all the rest were not. He's the perfect son of God, and he dies for us. And that's, the, that's how God reunites us. That's the overarching story. But scattered through all of Scripture in all of these pages is this incredible wisdom that can really bless our lives. And this, this passage is a great example of that. So let's just start with the word excellent. Um, if, if Paul is using, and we're not, we're not sure how he's doing this, but, but if Paul is using this word excellent, the way the Greeks used it, the first century Greeks, I mean non-Jewish, non-Christian Greeks, then it refers to excellence in pursuit of achievement, mastery in a specific field. It means that you, it means that you work hard to do a good job at whatever it is you're doing. The Greeks 
valued excellence. You can see that in their architecture. You can see that in their uh, statuary, in their literature. And that's not a new, that, that, that's not the only people that ever did that. Uh, through the centuries, people have valued excellence. Here's a, I think we have a picture of the Statue of Liberty's hair. Um, do we have a picture of that? Yes, we do somewhere. If we don't, I want you to imagine the Statue of Liberty's hair, all right? Frederick Bertoldi was the architect for the Statue of Liberty. And go home and Google it or Google it right now on your phone. Now you have my permission to pick up your device and look it up. You can, you can see the detail in the Statue of Liberty's hair. Now, why would he do that? I mean, as far as he knew, nobody was ever going to see the top of the Statue of Liberty. That thing was erected in 1875. The first airplane wasn't invented until 1903, 28 years later. He worried about that part that nobody would see because he was committed to excellence. So if Paul's using the word excellence there the way first century Greeks use it. He's just talking about doing a good job with whatever it is you do. But if he's using it the way a first century Jew would use it, then what he's talking about is moral excellence, or as some of the older translations put it, virtue. You're, if you use the King James or the New King James, you'll see the word virtue there instead of excellence. So instead of talking about doing a good job, Paul is talking about living a good life. Now, I've got to tell you the truth. I don't think there's a ton of difference between those two things. Because when you get right down to it, it's all about how you treat other people anyway. Tom Peters, who literally wrote the book on excellence, said that excellence is all the seemingly small acts that shout, we care, and which linger in the memories of those we interact with. For example, did you hear about the Target employee? Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, this kid walks into Target, he's wearing a suit, white shirt, no tie. And he goes into the men's department and he asks for a clip-on tie because he doesn't know how to tie a tie. And the, the Target team member says, this is Target, we don't sell clip-ons here, right? So he takes the kid over to the tie rack, helps him pick out the right color and the right pattern, and then teaches him how to tie the tie. And, and while, while, he's, while he's teaching him how to tie the tie, he asks what this is for, and the kid says, I've got a job interview. And so the target team member starts tossing out typical job interview questions to prepare the kid for him. And he gets his tie all tied up, and he sticks his hand out to shake, shake the kid's hand, and the kid gives him one of these, you know, handshakes that it's not really a handshake. And the target team member goes, mm-mm, mm-mm, give me your hand, grip the whole hand firmly, look me in the eye. And they practice shaking hands. And when the kid walks out of Target, all the other Target team members are going, go, go, go. And the kid gets a job at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> That's an awesome story. Because that Target team member is not just being a, a good, excellent employee. He's being a good person. Not a lot of difference between those two things. Did you hear about the Wendy's employee? There was a, a, and I'm not sure where this was, but, but there was this Wendy's and the employee and he saw this older man eating in the restaurant and, and then the older man finished and then he got his walker and he, he, he's following his walker to the door and when he gets to the door, the bottom just falls out of the sky, this torrential rainstorm. Well, you can't walk behind a walker and carry an umbrella, right? So the old guy goes ahead and pushes his way out the door. I guess he's just decided he's going to get soaked. The Wendy's employee runs out onto the patio, grabs one of their big patio umbrellas, and runs out there and holds it over the guy until he gets to his car. That's just awesome. That's an excellent employee. That's also a really good person. So I, I, there was a lady, and I, I just read about this one just this morning. There was a, a lady in Medford, New Jersey, named Ruth Reed. And she's got this thing that she does um, every week. She, there's a, like a coffee shop or something called Wawa. Uh, never been there, never, don't even know what it is. It sounds a little bit like a Starbucks crossed with a gas station. I'm not sure, okay? So she, she, her deal is that every 
every week she's going to buy somebody coffee who looks like they need it. She's just going to step up and pay for it just like, because, because it's a nice thing to do. Well, she was in there this past week and there was this dude that looked homeless and he didn't have enough money to pay for his coffee. So she stepped up and said, my name is Ruth and I do this all the time. I'm going to pay for your coffee. What's your name? And he said, my name is Keith. And she said, well, that is kind of funny because you look like Keith Urban. And he said, I am Keith Urban. <laughs> she said, no, where, where's Nicole and the kids? <laughs> and he said, no, really? And she said, yeah. And he said, here's my bodyguard. And, the, and it really was Keith Urban. If you don't know, if you're not a Christian, you don't know who Keith Urban is. He's this country music star. Okay. So it was kind of a neat story. MasterCard heard about that. And they sent Ruth 52 prepaid cards so she can keep on doing that for the, for the rest of forever. That's a neat story. Okay, I wanna, I wanna show you one more. Um, and I've got a video for this one. And this one's, okay, this, I'm gonna tell you, normally our videos are like two minutes long. This one's like almost four, but it's worth it. Uh, TD Bank in Ontario decided that they wanted to exercise some corporate virtue, some corporate excellence. And here's, here's how they did it. Watch this clip. Hello there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm here to thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Christine. Bonjour, Karine. Bonjour. Hi, Michael. Hi. I'm ATM. You know what ATM stands for? Automated teller machine? That is correct, normally, but today you're wrong. I'm an automated thanking machine. Hey, oh. look at that, buddy. <laughs> That's for you. That's on TD Canada Trust. Thank you. Selfie. Get my good side. There's a slot that's opening. Oh up. my goodness. Never in all my life had such a beautiful surprise. Yeah, you've been uh, helping your daughter out, is that correct? Yes. We've got something for you, Christine. We, there's something that's about to come out there. Those are two piggy banks. Those are for your kids. Well, we've got a little something for you because you're a famous customer. We know you love the Jays so much. Look on the other side of me. There's another slot that's going to open up. <laughs> on the left wow. side there, yeah. That's awesome. She's my only daughter. She has cancer and she had uh, an operation on Tuesday. We wanted to thank you in a very specialized way. There's actually a card coming out for you right there. And if you look inside each piggy bank, there's a check for $1,000 to start an RESP for each of your kids. No way. Yes. Yeah, right. That outfit. <laughs> well, the thanking's not done, Christy. What? Here's the thing. If you tell your kids, hey, here's an RESP, they'll be all, nah. But if you tell them you're taking them to a place like Disney. No. Yes, you're taking your kids to a magical place <laughs> in California, Christine. I've never been able to take my kids anywhere. Oh. <laughs> it's wonderful that you've been with us for so long that we got, uh, we got somebody who might want to talk to you for a second about that. <laughs> Oh my God. During this time, we have come to know how giving, loving, and supportive you are, especially to your daughter in Trinidad. She's a lucky woman to be able to call you mom. So I just threw you a ball, but Sunday you'll be throwing me a ball. Oh my God. You'll be throwing out the first pitch. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. I got goosebumps right now. Actually, Dorothy, could you? Could you lean in for a second? Because I have a secret to tell you. Just lean in very close. We want you to thank her yourself. So we've got some something coming out of the slot right now. Something right there for you. And those are tickets. Those are tickets to Trinidad. Are you serious? I am serious. You're going to go see your daughter in Trinidad. That's true. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dorothy.
And so now we're all going to switch to TD Bank, right? So <laughs> excellence means that you, you treat people right. You do the right thing. Uh, and here's what we don't really think. We think, okay, that's just, we only see stuff like that on the internet. There's only, the only time you ever see that is stuff on the internet. It's in Raleigh or it's in Ontario or it's in New Jersey. It's never here, but it is here. In fact, it's right here in our own church because two weeks ago, one of our own members, Shane Basham, went to Vanderbilt University Hospital and gave stem cells, donated stem cells to a woman in Portugal whom he's never met. That's pretty awesome. Shane, can we give you a big hand? Let's, all right. Let me read you something Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He's talking to the Corinthians about how to navigate their faith in this really pagan culture. Now, it's just, it's, you, we think it's bad. It's we, nothing compared to what they were trying to, to do, live out their faith in this culture. And so here's, here's what he says to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Excellence, this word that, that Paul is talking about in Philippians 4, moral excellence means seeking the good of others. And it, that works in your business, that works in your school, that works in your neighborhood, that works in your life, and it walks in the steps of Jesus. Look, if, if you're an employee on the arsenal or somewhere in town, because you're a child of God, you should be the best employee that company has. You should be the best student in your class because you're a Christian. You should be the best team member on your, on your team or in your play or in your band. You should be the best husband, the best wife, the best neighbor, the best friend. Because we want to bring glory to God with how we live. That's a, that's a huge call, but that's walking in the steps of Jesus. And if we do that, if we'll live that way, it'll give the people standing around at our funeral some great stories to tell. And then there's the other word, praiseworthy. Years ago, Stephen Covey took a really old metaphor and, and just popularized it. And he, he wrote about beginning with the end in mind. And he said, here's what that means. Beginning with the end in mind means to know where you're going so that you better understand where you are now and so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. He wrote, it's incredibly easy to get caught up in an activity trap, in the busyness of life, to work harder and harder, now listen, to work harder and harder at climbing the ladder of success only to discover it's leaning against the wrong wall. Excellence asks the question, are you doing good work? Praiseworthy asks the question, is the good work you are doing the work that ought to be done? Is your ladder leaning against the right wall? One of the greatest tragedies is to give your life to the excellent pursuit of the wrong thing, to succeed at the wrong goal. Sermon time out. We are in the middle of a visioning process. And we are trying to answer the question, what does God want this church to be in 20 years? It's not too early to ask that question because 20 years will get here like that. And there are things, beginning with the end in mind means that there are things that we should be doing right now and things that we should not be doing right now to be the church God wants us to be in 20 years. But we really don't know what that is yet because we haven't answered the question, who does God want us to be? There are two dates that are really, really important. One of them is this Saturday, this coming Saturday, which I think is the 18th, is that right? Is this coming Saturday the 18th? And then the next one is Sunday the 9th, September 9th. Is that right, Jay? 
18th and the 9th, okay? We are asking you to come be a part of one of those two meetings where we're going to sit around and talk with each other about, about what God wants us to be. We need for you to be a part of one of those. Now, those are going to be pretty long meetings, three and a half, four hours. That's a long meeting. I think they'll go by really quickly because of the conversation and because of what we're going to be talking about. We just read in First Chronicles, if, you, if you're uh, current, in our, and I'm actually still a little bit behind, but I just read in First Chronicles this past week about the men. You know how that First Chronicles reads like a phone book of all these names? And every now and then there's one that looks familiar, right? I was reading it, and then I ran across these guys in First Chronicles 12 called the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Do you realize that you may be a person like that in our church? You may have a unique understanding of our times, and you may have an interesting idea about what we should do to be the church God wants us to be. If you're not in one of these meetings, you can't make that contribution. And if you don't make that contribution, listen to me. Something really, really important might be left out. Now, I know that it's asking a lot to give up four hours on a Saturday or four hours on a uh, Sunday afternoon. It's hard. We got kids, we got stuff, we got things. Here's how Lisa and I are going to do it. On, she's going to come to the Saturday meeting, and I'm going to stay home and take care of her dad. And then when it's time for the Sunday meeting, she's going to stay home, and I'm going to come to the meeting. Maybe one dad needs to, maybe the dad needs to stay home on Saturday so mom can come. Maybe mom needs to stay home so dad can come. We'll help you pay for child care. Let's figure out a way to get here and do this. If your voice isn't a part of this conversation, something important might be missed. You need to be there. Call our office this week, shoot us an email, sign up for one of these days. I'm asking you, I'm urging you, I'm begging you to do it. Okay? All right. Sermon time in. All right, we're back. It, there's a book called Who Switched the Price Tags? Tony Campolo. And he tells a story about an African-American church in Philadelphia that had a, a student recognition service each year. The thing is, this church was situated in a neighborhood where the kids, most kids didn't graduate from high school and go to college. So when they did graduate and, and go to college, this church made a big deal about it. And so they, they would have the kids come up on stage and say, I'm going to school here, and here's what I'm going to study. And then after each kid would do that, you'd have 500 grandmothers and grandfathers out there responding with, mm, yes, Jesus, hallelujah, just affirming that kid on what, on what he or she had chosen to do. And then when all the kids had finished and all the grandparents had, had finished affirming them, the preacher got up and he said, Children, children, you're going to die. You don't think you're going to die, but you're going to die. And they're going to take you out to the cemetery, and they're going to drop your box in a hole, and then they're going to go back to the church building and eat potato salad. <laughs> he said, now, when you were born, you were the only one who cried. Everybody else was laughing. That's not important now. Here's what's important. What will they do when you die? Will they be happy because of how you lived or will they be crying? Here's what he was saying. Whatever you do, do it with excellence. But don't just do whatever. Live a life that is excellent and praiseworthy. Right about now, some of us are wishing we'd heard this message about 10 bad choices ago. At the beginning, I asked if you could imagine yourself celebrated. And there's some of us in the room who went, not really. Don't even want to think about what they're going to say about me at my funeral. I'm just glad I won't be there. Uh, earlier, the, we heard a couple of stories from Jesus from Luke chapter 15, one about a lost coin, one about a lost sheep. And both stories talk about the rejoicing that happens in heaven 
when lost causes are recovered. Jesus told one other story there in that part of Luke 15. This young man apparently gets tired of farm life and he takes his share of the inheritance and he moves in with some friends in a distant party town and it's a long way from home and things go predictably bad. The bottom drops out of the economy, his investments dry up, he winds up working a menial job, barely getting by. He finally comes to his senses and heads home. He's prepared for a sermon from his father. I mean, wouldn't you expect that? You've made a mess of your life. You're going home. You're gonna, you know you're just going to get a sermon. He figures for the next several years he's going to be working off his debt as a hired hand on the farm he once called home. He's counting on a most chilly reception. Here's how Jesus describes it. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, is found. And so they began to celebrate. That young man was counting on condemnation. Instead, he got compassion. He was counting on criticism. Instead, he got a celebration. I told you two of the things I want you to say at my funeral. Don't, don't he look good? And remember that time? Here's the third thing. I, I would love for it to be said truthfully. He was lost and is found. He was dead but is alive. And he is celebrated by God. Because that's what God does when people who have made really bad choices turn back to him. That's what God will do for you. If you've made bad choices and you've made a mess of things, we can still celebrate because that's what God will do if you'll come back. Hey, if you need to talk to somebody this week, give us a call. Don't sit alone in that. Know that God loves you and will celebrate your return. Let's stand. Let's sing a song together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. 
I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, whoa, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me, whoa, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. I was going to say that there was a fourth thing that they would say at the end of yours. It would be drama queen, but it was such a good sermon, I decided not to say that, except actually just did sorry. That was great. <laughs> was that not a great morning? Can we get an amen in here? <laughs> hey, a few things in your bulletin. Make sure you just check those out, things that are going on. I would remind you of one thing. Next Sunday... Right after this service, we will start tearing down the gym from the end of our children's program all summer long, and we need some help getting some of those things down, so please, if you can, a few of you stay after and help Cody Smith and Walton Harless with that. I used to teach school with a guy named Clay Barty, and Clay Barty would close chapel every day at Alabama Christian Academy with this admonition to the students. He would say, students, go out there today, find somebody somewhere, and do something nice for them. And that's exactly the admonition that we need today after this great morning. As we close in prayer, have a great week this week. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you today and thank you for Jesus. Father, thank you for him emptying himself, oh Lord, just to be that humble servant for us and showing us how to serve in excellence. And Father, I'm just so thankful, too, for all the examples we have uh, here among us and just among our friends and family who show us how to serve. And Father, again, we're just so thankful for Jesus and uh, being the ultimate servant uh, who came to, to serve for us. Father, as we go through this week, I pray also that we just listen to your spirit in our lives. Father, uh, we have a lot of voices, and, but uh, Father, we just pray that uh, we put your voice and your spirit uh, ahead of everything, Father, that we listen to that and that we find ways to uh, uh, seek out and serve others in our world and in our community. Father, thank you so much for uh, the time we've had together. Thank you for the lesson we've heard and just be with us as we go this week and your, as your servants. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>